Howdy howdy, this is Mr. Potter. Today we're going to start a two-part series on dealing with average rates of change and instantaneous rates of change. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at it from the average rate of change situation. And we're also going to take a look at some secant lines. So I'm going to start with what we learned back in Algebra 1. In Algebra 1 we introduced this concept of average rate of change, which I'm going to call AROC for short. But the whole idea is that this we called this slope. And we had formulas for slope. At the first we learned this very basic rise over run. And then later on we started talking about the change in y over the change in x. And then finally we got to a very formulaic y sub 2 minus y sub 1 over x sub 2 minus x sub 1. And so this is what we used back in Algebra 1 to figure out our average rates of change. Now when we went to Algebra 2 we, we started realizing that hey this y that we're talking about this is really some function of x or it's really some function of t. So when I say that my slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, what I'm really saying is that I have y of x2 minus y of x1 over x2 minus x1. Or I've got y of t2 minus y of t1 over t2 minus t1. In other words, I've got the change in my independent variable where I substitute in my two domain points divided by the change in my independent variable. So dependent variable divided by independent variable. And that's where we're at from Algebra 2. So I want to start by taking a look at a practical problem. The idea is that if I am indeed falling, the formula for how far I've fallen is a function of the time that I fall, which in this case is 16t squared, where t is time in seconds and y is the height in feet. And so what I've got here is a parabolic curve. with these data points. I know that after I've fallen one second, one squared is one, one times 16 is 16. After I've fallen two seconds, two squared is four, and four times 16 is 64 feet. After three seconds, three squared is nine, and nine times 16 is 144. After four seconds, four squared is 16, and 16 times 16 is 16 squared, 256. And after I've fallen five seconds, five squared is 25, and 25 times 16 is 400 feet. So what I've got here is the height that I fall depends on the time that I've fallen. And I have a set of points here. I mean, I could think of this as a table as well, where I'm dealing with time, and the height that I've fallen, and after 1, 16, after 2 seconds, 64, and so forth. What I want to do is I want to take a look at these values, and I want to see if I can infer some type of justification to answer a pretty interesting question. So I want to talk about these secant lines. Now we just had a parabola and we had points on that parabola. So I had the point 1, 16, I had the point 2, 64, I had the point 3, 144, 4, 256, and 5, 400. But if I take a look at the secant lines, remember that secant lines in geometry were the lines that crossed a curve at two places. So if I want to look at the secant line between this point 1, 16, and this point up here, 5, 400. My tangent line, I mean, excuse me, my secant line, let's try that again. There's my secant line, and the slope of the secant line is going to be 400 minus 16 over 5 minus 1. So that's 384 over 4, which comes out to 96. And my units here 
deal with the units that I have in the ratio. I have feet in my numerator, I have seconds in my denominator, and so this is feet per second, which means this is a speed, this is a velocity that I'm falling from one to five. This is actually my average speed. And so what I can do is I can continue talking about secant lines between 116 and my 0.4 comma 256. So if I were to draw this secant line, obviously I've got a secant line that's not as steep, so this slope should be less. And if I calculate that, I find 256 minus 16 over 4 minus 1. So I end up with 240 over 3, which is 80 feet per second. And I do have this confirmation that this is a shallower line, so it should be a smaller slope. So if I were to take a look at the slope between 116 and this point 3144, then I'm going to have to do 144 minus 16 over 3 minus 1, which gives me 128 divided by 2, which is 64 feet per second. And I can continue this. Of course, each time I draw the secant line, I'm getting a shallower and shallower line, so my slope should be decreasing. But my question is, what happens if I take this to its logical end? In other words, what happens if, instead of a secant line, I actually end up with something that touches only at one spot, what we called in algebra a tangent line? So we'll get back to that a little bit later. I want to talk about the equations of these lines. So what happened is all of these lines are passing through the same point. They're all passing through the point 116, but we had several different slopes, several different average rates of change. My first line that I drew had a slope of 96, and so my equation is going to be y minus 16 equals 96 times x minus 1, or y equals 96x minus 80. The second line that I drew had a slope of 80, and so I'm dealing with y minus 16 equals 80 times x minus 1, or y equals 80x minus 64. And if I continue this trend, the situation where my slope was uh, 64, y minus 16 equals 64 times x minus 1. So that would be 64x minus 48. Or y minus 16 equals 48 times x minus 1. I'm going to have y equals 48x minus 32. I notice not only is my slope changing, but my y-intercept is changing as well. And the less steep that my line is, the closer to the origin my y-intercept is. And if I go back to my previous graphs, I can see that confirmation. My very first blue line was very steep, and so its y-intercept is going to be very low as compared to each subsequent line, which would end up crossing and of course drawing not to scale at a higher y-intercept. So the question is then, what is my ultimate secant line? Because I can't say, well, it's a tangent line, so it's going to be y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, because that's going to give me 0 over 0, and I remember from earlier talking about limits that weird things happen when I have a zero on top and zero on bottom. It usually means I have some type of common factor. But what I would rather do is I'd rather take a look at this from some points that are a little bit closer on the parabola.
So if I had the point 116, let's say that I'm using an x value of 1.5. And if x is 1.5, y ends up being 36. And so this secant line, which is very close to being a tangent line on this scale, the slope of this would be 36 minus 16 over 1.5 minus 1 or 20 divided by 0.5, which gives me 40 feet per second. If I try something even closer, let's say 1.1, which gives me a y value of 19.36, when I calculate the slope, I'm doing 19.36 minus 16 over 1.1 minus 1, which gives me 3.36 divided by uh, point 0.1 or 33.6 feet per second. So what I notice is that this is decreasing, but it's decreasing towards a certain amount. So my ultimate would be something that was, oh, just a hair beyond 1. So I'd have to be figuring out what f of 1 plus h is minus f of 1 over my x2 minus x1. And ultimately I'd like to know what happens as this h gets smaller and smaller. In fact, what happens if I let h go to zero? But that's a story for another time. This is Mr. Potter. Thank you for watching. Have a great day.